Hello and welcome to another episode of the Farbank Fly Fishing School. I'm your host, Simon Gorsworth, and today I'm going to talk about the basic equipment you need to go fly fishing. And really, the basic equipment can be distilled into two parts, the essentials and then the periphery stuff, the stuff that actually helps you but you don't necessarily need. So the first thing you absolutely need is you've got to have yourself a fly rod. A fly rod is absolutely essential. Like any kind of fishing, you've got to have a rod. There's a fly rod. On the fly rod, like again, like any form of fishing, you're going to have to put on a reel. Here's a fly reel. On the reel, you're going to have to put on a fly line. That's really essential too. So these are vital components. And then there's something called backing. And all of this gets put together, and that is the most essential part of your equipment. I'm going to go into detail of this in a moment, um, but I just want to run through a kind of a, a shopping list, if you like, of the gear that you need for fly fishing. Now, you can get those individually. You can go into a local fly shop and just say, can you set me up with a, an outfit? And they'll happily do that. But equally, you can also, a really good move for a lot of novice fishermen is to start off by getting what's called an, a fly fishing outfit or a kit like this. This is a perfect example, right? In here, in this package is a rod and a reel with backing and a fly line on all in a single kit. So if you're a bit worried about going in and, and, and not asking the right questions or not getting the right kind of stuff, then get yourself an outfit like that and you'll find that you've got all that essential stuff in one single package and it's balanced, it's gonna work really well. Now, in addition to those kind of key things, you're obviously gonna need a few more accoutrements. There's leaders, right? You gotta have a leader on the front end of your fly line and that's an essential item. Can't get away without a leader. You're also gonna to have to have some spools of tippet material. Again, another vital item that you've got to have with you. And far more important probably is a box of flies. Right? Depending on what you're fishing, where you're fishing, you're going to have a variety of flies, but you've got to take with you a selection of flies fishing. And really that's your essential equipment that you can get away with. You need that kind of amount of gear to go fly fishing to start off with. And as I said, I'm going to go into a lot of detail about each of these key items as we progress through this video. But in addition to those things, there's a few accoutrements, as I mentioned, that will help your day on the water. Um, I like to keep these things on a little lanyard. So for example, there's three things here. These are snippers. You could have some scissors on here or just nips like this. This is to cut the ends of your line. That's an essential thing to have. I also have a pair of forceps or hemostats. And these have a, serve a couple of uses. One thing I like to do is I like to fish what's called a barbless hook. And we'll talk about a bit about that, but a barbless hook is where you squash down a barb. This is a material or an item that will do that nicely. This is also really good if you hook a fish and the fly isn't right in the edge of its mouth, but it's down in its mouth a little bit. You can put these forceps down the fish's mouth and kind of unhook it uh, without jamming your fingers in there and choking the poor thing. Uh, and then the other thing I like to keep on my lanyard here is just a hook sharpener because you're going to be fishing and sometimes you're going to snag the bottom or hit a rock behind you and blunt your hook. So I like to sharpen my hook. So that's a kind of a utility belt type thing. And then just for your own safety, I would strongly recommend you fly fish with just some glasses on, protect your eyes. Not good getting a hook in your eye, believe me. Thankfully, touch wood, that hasn't happened to me, but I've seen pictures and they, oh my God, they're so, I'm so squeamish. And these ones are polarized. That's a really good thing for fly fishermen because it helps cut out the glare and helps you see fish in the water. There's also a hat, right? Any old hat will do. I like a hat on my head, protect it. You don't want to get a hook driven into your head, so much better get it driven into your hat than your head. And really, those are the main items. You can get bits and pieces like tippet rings and strike indicators and split shot and this and that. There's lots of items you can add to that. And you probably will in your fly fishing career add to those basic items. But those, that's a really good starting point. And then really, I guess the last thing is you've got to put them all in something. Uh, there's a number of options out there in the fly fishing world. Personally, I like the fly fishing vest or waistcoat. For English like me, we call it a waistcoat. Very nice. Um, but this is... You know, it's got lots of pockets. I can put my leaders in one pocket and I can put tippet in another pocket and I can put piles and piles of flies and float in and lots of things like that. So I wear this vest when I'm fishing and everything is with me. That's a really good thing about carrying all this gear wherever you're going. And on the back of the vest, I just clip on a net like this because again, hey, I'm going to catch fish one day and I want a net handy to be able to land it. So that's my preference as a vest. 
Some people have what's called a pack, and a pack is something you wear around your waist. You can also have a net in the pack, and you can have all the things that you utilize inside that pack. And yet another way of carrying gear, of course, is just a humble fishing bag, right? So you can just take a fishing bag and, and just dump everything in that, and again, clip your net on. So you do need something really to transport all this material about uh, with you when you're fishing, and that makes it just simple, right? You pick up your bag or your vest or your pack, and off you go and everything's in it. So that's a little nutshell about the kind of gear you need to go out fly fishing. And as I said, I just gonna wanna go into a bit more detail on the rod, the reel, the line, leads at the tippet, give you a bit more information so that when you choose an outfit to go fly fishing, you've got some knowledge about how to choose the right outfit for wherever you're going. <music> First thing I'm going to look at is the fly rod. Probably the most expensive component you're going to buy. So it's good to understand how they differ and what type of rod you use in what type of situation. In front of me, I've got a fly rod. I've taken it out of the tube and I've taken it out of the rod sock. That's what it's called, the bag, if you like. It lives in. Those are its protective elements. And here, as you can see, is a four-piece fly rod. Now, this rod, like all fly rods, is going to have a handle at the bottom end. And generally speaking, fly rods have got a cork handle. And it's just a bit bigger than a hand size. At the bottom of the cork handle is what's called the reel seat. This is where the reel goes on. More on showing you how that's done when we put the reel on. And there's a couple of little things here. There's a sliding collar that goes up and down. And then there's a rotating little nut here that kind of locks things into place. All right. And then just above the cork handle, there's a little ring here. This is called the keeper ring. And generally speaking, this is where once you've threaded the rod up, you hook your fly into to kind of stop it blowing around and catching things and people. It is not a guide that you thread your line through. I've seen that mistake too many times. So don't thread your line through that. That's where your hook goes into. And then other than that, this rod has nothing else. That is the butt section of the rod. It's the fattest part. And that will attach to the second section, the second section as you notice, the rod is tapered. All sections of rods are going to have a taper gradually getting thinner and thinner as it goes towards the top end. There's a couple of rod rings on this end. This is the butt guide or the stripping guide, depending on what you like to call it. That's the bottom guide, the first guide nearest the reel. And then it goes through this. And then it gets to the next section, and that continues the taper, gets a little bit thinner and thinner. And you can see there's a few more rod rings and guides on this one. And then it gets up to the top section, which is the thinnest, flimsiest, stretchiest, bounciest piece of all. And it has the most number of rod rings, including what is called the tip ring at the very end. So a little simple terminology of a fly rod. When you buy fly rods, they vary in a number of ways, but perhaps two of them are really essential to understand when you're a novice fly fisher. And those two are what's called the length of the rod. That's a pretty easy one. Nine foot long, six foot long, 12 foot long. That's a pretty easy one. But they also vary a very interesting one called weight. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that the weight means how heavy is the rod? This is 2.7 ounces. That's the weight. Well, it doesn't work out that way in fly fishing circles. In fly fishing, the weight refers to the size of the line you're putting on it. I'm going to talk about lines shortly, but it refers to the size of the line. Let's kind of clarify all that by showing you what I've got here. When you look at this rod, you'll see this rod says 590-4. And what the 5 means, that number means it is for a 5-weight line. That's what the 5 is. And the 90 means it's 9 foot 0 inches in length. That's the length. And if you really didn't know what that meant, as you look further along, it says 5-weight, 9 foot. So it tells you what that is. And what's fairly important in the early stages of fishing and fly fishing is that you match the line to the rod. So if the rod says five weight, the line also should say five weight. Now rods can differ, as I said, in length as well as weight. So generally speaking, in the fly fishing world, the shortest rod is probably going to be about six foot long. Really short thing, about the same height as me. And the longest rod is probably going to be 10 foot long, especially when we're talking one-handed rods. You can get into two-handed rods that get to 15 and 18 and 20 foot long. We're not going to go there. We're just going to talk in the simple one-handed rods. So somewhere between six foot and 10 foot is the length of rod you'll end up getting when you go get your first fly rod. 
And in a nutshell, the shorter the rod is, the better it is for overgrown rivers and creeks and small streams like that because you haven't got a long rod sticking and catching all the branches. So if, as you get to fish smaller and smaller rivers, you want to get down to smaller and smaller rods. The longer rods, generally speaking, give you more distance. And so bigger rivers mean you can cast further with a longer rod. So you'd go from a six foot to a seven foot to an eight foot, maybe to a nine, maybe even to a 10 foot rod if you're fishing on the side of a lake when you need to throw your line as far as possible. So as I said, they do vary in lengths, but generally speaking, keep that rule of thumb in mind. The longer the rod, the further it casts, but the more it's gonna snag trees and bushes behind you and above you. So you've got to master that. And if you really want to just choose kind of the, the vanilla flavor of fly rods, just get a nine foot rod. That's usually a really good starting place for an ideal rod length. What's a little bit more complicated is the weight. So the weight, as I mentioned, refers to the fly line you put on it. I have a five weight rod, I want a five weight line, and that's a beautifully balanced thing. Lines, rod weights, can go anything from a 1 to a 12. There are fringes either side, but for the sake of simplicity, we're not even going to touch that. The lower the number, the lighter the weight the line is. And the bigger the number, therefore, the heavier the line is. So heavy lines will cast further. Light lines won't cast as far, but they'll land very, very gently on the water. So as a simple rule of thumb, the, when you need a line to land gently because you're fishing small rivers and you don't need distance and you've got spooky trout, you want to go down to those lower numbers, maybe a two weight or maybe a three weight. When you're fishing medium sized rivers and you need a little bit longer cast and you're going to throw some slightly bigger flies and the, and the presentation isn't so important, you probably want a four weight, maybe a five weight probably, or maybe even a six weight. Those are your go-to trout sizes. And then usually the 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s, they're becoming more exotic species. Your salmon, steelhead, saltwater, tarpon, things like that. Those are species that require bigger rods. But as a trout angler, you're probably looking between 2s and 6s. And again, if you want our vanilla flavor, our flavor that does everything, start off with a 5 weight. It's a perfect starting point. So a 9 foot 5 weight, 4 piece rod, really should be a, a go-to Great starting point for fly rods. And once you've got your rod, you've got to put on a fly reel. So let me clear the table and take a little look at fly reels and I'll dig a couple of them out and show you how those fly reels can differ. Just like the fly rod, a reel, the fly reel, has a number. Uh, this one is a number four. My rod is number five. That doesn't really match. This reel will take a three and four line. This reel will take a five and six line. It says on the reel, five weight. And this ginormous reel here will take a nine, 10. So if my rod is a nine or 10 weight rod, I'm gonna get a reel this size, the nine or 10 weight reel, I'm gonna get a nine or 10 weight line to go on it. And that's really what's called a balanced outfit, where you match a rod to your reel to your fly line balanced outfit. Because we're trout anglers, essentially we're going to be talking about five weights. As I said, that's the vanilla one. That's the one that's kind of just does everything, right? If you just want something that will do it all, go for a five weight, go for a nine foot five weight. So when I've got my five weight rod, I'm going to buy my five weight reel and attach my five weight reel to the rod. So let me show you how to do that because there's a couple of little sneaky little tips, if you like. The first thing you have to do is you have to look underneath the cork handle to find a recess, there's a little recess, a little cave there. And that cave is where my reel seat, actually I'm gonna put on this one because I wanna show you something with the fly line, where my reel seat goes. I'm gonna put one leg underneath that recess there. And then this rotating collar has another recess and I slide that rotating collar over the reel seat here. And then I just lock it into place with this nut. Okay, so that's how you attach your reel to your rod. And what's pretty important about fly fishing is to recall that the reel's always down. So you always want the reel down underneath the rod. Now, why should that matter, you may ask? Well, it all comes in to play when you talk about the direction that the reel winds. Right? This handle, as you can see, is on the left. I could have put this reel on. 
let me take it off, by turning it around, doing exactly the same setup. But when I've tightened this nut, you'll see that the handle is now on my right. right? So you can put a reel on either side. And pretty well every fly reel you buy can be adjusted to be left hand wind or right hand wind. And what that means I'm going to explain. Personally, I like a right hand wind reel. Um, I just wind right hand. I always have. So I wind with my right hand and hold the roll with my left. The majority of reels you buy these days are actually left hand wind. That's how they come. And the theory is if you're a right handed fisherman, then you can wind with your left hand. You don't have to change hands. I have to change hands to wind in. That's a personal choice. So what does the wind direction mean? Well, and how do you know? The thing about setting a line up and the reel up on a rod is that when you go and thread the line up the rod, it should always come out from the bottom of the reel facing forward, facing up the rod. That's, a, that's an easy setup. You see, when the reel's on this way, that looks great. If I was to put this reel on the wrong way to the wind direction, you'll note that the reel comes off the line, sorry, line comes off the reel backwards when it's at the bottom. That's going the wrong way. The rod's the other direction. That's not very good. Um, or you could have it go, well, I'm gonna just gonna make it go forward by threading it through this gap. Well, if you do that, you see the line comes off the top of the reel. See how that differs? So that's coming off wrong. So that's telling me that I've put this reel on the wrong way. I want the line to come off the bottom of the reel, facing up the rod. So that's how you tell if you've got your line on the right way or the wrong way. As I said, when you buy your reel, uh, set it up the way you want to wind. If you want to wind left-handed, it'll probably be that setup. If you want to wear, uh, wind it right-handed, you can change the drag system around to a right-hand wind, or you can just take it to your local fly shop and do it that way. But pretty well, all reels can be switched from left-hand wind to right-hand wind. Now, the significance of the reel is that, let me just thread this through, you'll find a fly reel has, a, in this case, a little star-shaped kind of knob here, which can twist around. This knob's called a drag system. I like a drag system in my reels. Trout reels, steelhead, salmon, bonefish, whatever it is, I like a drag system. And what that does, if I slacken this off, if I undo it as much as I can, what that means is it takes very little effort. You see how easy it is to pull the line off the reel? So I've loosened that drag. That's a free reeling reel there. It comes off very, very easily. You might want that, you might not, but I'm telling you what the drag is. If I turn that drag all the way around the opposite direction until it stops, you will find that this reel, <laughs> you can hardly pull line off the reel. All right, so that's a drag system on a reel. Now, the reason you have a drag system on a reel is because you're fishing and you hook a big fish and a big fish is strong and maybe it's running down the river and you've hooked this large fish and, and it's running away and you're starting to run out of line. Well, gradually you tighten this drag up to a point where that fish is working harder and harder to pull line off. Obviously not so much that you break it, but it makes that fish work harder. It tires it out and enables you to get that fish in quicker. Whereas if it was completely free, the fish will run away with all your line, you'll lose your line, you'll lose your backing, and you'll lose the fish of your dreams. So the drag's a pretty important part of the whole complex and the whole system. And pretty well, most modern fly reels have a drag system these days. The other part to notice about a fly reel is that a fly reel, uh, as I said, it comes in different sizes. When you buy a fly reel, they are going to come kind of naked like this. There's nothing on there. I'm going to put my fly line on the fly reel. But before I put a fly line on the fly reel, I need to put some stuff called backing on. And I'll explain why in a moment. But one thing that's nice to know about fly reels is that different reels have different ways of doing it. But you can undo the center catch with this particular reel and take the two parts of the reel like that. Take them apart. Uh, this is called the spool. And this is called the frame. OK, so there's two components to reel. They slot together fit in beautifully. This one tightens up with a little nut like that. And then that's your reel. So really, that's fly reels, right? You've got to have to find the right or left hand wind system. You're going to have to play around with the drag to kind of get familiar with what is the right drag for you to for the fish you're catching and just get familiar with the fact that you can take the spool out and drop it back in again with, in this case, this center nut. So really, they're pretty nice. 
They are very useful tools. Unlike spin fishing, the reel has nothing to do with fishing technique, right? With spin fishing, you're going to throw your line out and then wind your spinner in or your web bait in. And that winding is what makes the fly in, oh, sorry, spoon or worm or whatever it is come towards you. In fly fishing, that's absolutely not the case. In fly fishing, the reel is really no more than storage. And so in fly fishing, when your reel's on the rod and you've threaded the rod up and you go fishing, you're going to strip the line off and you're going to fish away with that length of line and you'll pull the line in with your hand rather than wind in with your reel. And that pulling in means you've got to cast it back out again. And that's what fly fishing is. So don't use your reel to wind the line in at the end of the day. Sorry, when you're fishing, don't use the reel at all for that. Just but at the end of the day, sure. That's when you wind your line in, take the reel off your rod and put the reel back in its little case to protect it. And that is reels. And on that reel, last thing we're going to take a conversation of, I said, we're going to put on a backing, we're going to put on fly lines. So let's clear this shelf here and I'm going to rig up a few fly lines and talk about perhaps the most difficult, most confusing part of tackle, which is the fly line. <music> Fly lines really are complicated, unknown, misunderstood, and even to a lot of people, just a thing. Oh, just give me a five fly line, a five foot fly line, just something that matches my rod. But there's much more to a fly line than that, and choosing the right line will have a great result on your day. You choose the wrong line, it's not going to work. Your day is going to be miserable. And if you choose the right line, your rod casts beautifully. It's a beautiful blend of balance and, and loading and everything's good. So understanding a little bit about fly lines, pretty important at this stage of the game, because you're going to go out and you're going to buy yourself a fly line if you've already got the rod and reel. So let's talk about fly lines. I'm going to keep it fairly simple. I can get really nitty gritty and into depth and bore everybody to death with fly lines because I love them and I'm kind of passionate about them, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to touch on some real basic things to think about. So here's a fly line. It's on the reel. It's just a bit of thicker colored stuff. That's the weight for casting. The weight that bends your rod, the weight that takes your fly out, that's what your fly line is. And really a fly line is pretty simple in, uh, in what it's made of. A fly line starts with what's called the core. The core, this is a fly line core. This is its strength. This is, this is an uncoated fly line, essentially. What happens to this is this gets coated in a liquid plastisol. Right. This is a liquid PVC, and these will go into an oven and they'll cure, and what happens, it out comes a fly line. So really a fly line is pretty simple in components, a core and a coating. They differ, but we're not going to go into that. Not yet, anyway. So all this time we've been talking about the kind of the basic fly fishing kit being a nine foot five weight rod and getting that reel that takes a five weight line. And we're talking about getting a five weight fly line as well to go onto that five weight rod. So if you've got a five weight rod, we need to get a five weight line. But how do you know? Well, there's a thing on a fly line box called the code. It's written on boxes, it's printed on fly lines, it's printed in catalogs, it's printed in websites. And the code is this thing down here, these large letters. And you'll see in the case of this one, this has four letters or letters and numbers, D, T, 4, F. And that will tell you everything you need to know about this fly line. So what is the code? Well, the first two letters refer to the shape. The shape is either going to have DT or it's going to have WF. Those are the first two letters. It's either going to be DT or WF. Hands down, by far, the commonest is WF. So if, if you're getting into this for the first time, forget about the DT, get the, D, the WF. And what WF means, it stands for what shape the fly line is. So the first two letters tell you the shape. WF stands for weight forward. DT stands for double taper. Now, you're not going to know what that is, so I'm going to spin this box around and hopefully we'll be able to see on the back of this box the shape of the line. This box actually has both shapes here side by side to give you a rough idea. A line at the bottom is a DT. So the D DT line here is all fat, fat blue, flat, fat orange, and then a little taper at this end and a little taper at that end. Okay, that's a DT, fat with a taper at each end. A WF, a weight forward line, this is the same line, but in a weight forward 
version, you can see that this orange section is very, very, very thin. And then the head, the blue bit, is very, very fat. In other words, all the weight is forward. Weight forward, double taper. And this thin line behind it, that's called running line. We're not going to go into the whys and wheres of double tapers and weight forwards at this point in time. Do start with a weight forward. Hands down, it's the easiest line to start off casting. Maybe down the road, you'll go to a double taper line. So that's what the code is. The first two letters refer to the shape of that line. Then the number comes in, and that number, in this case a four, that relates to your fly rod. If you've got a five weight rod, then that line number should say five weight. That's your match. If I've got a four weight line, I better hope that my rod's a four weight rod. That would be a match. A four weight line on a five weight rod is not a match. Okay, so that's what that second thing is, that number. And then the last little thing is a, is a, a letter that's either going to be F or S, possibly I. And that refers to its density. This line floats, so it's going to end in F. It means when you cast it out, the whole line sits on the top of the water and just floats. Again, probably your go-to line is going to be a floating line. Probably your go-to line should be a weight forward. And if you have the five weight rod, because that's probably your go-to rod, the standard line most people fish and buy when they start off fly fishing is a WF5F. That's what that code is. Now we could stop there, but because this chapter and this whole episode is on fly lines, I'm just going to delve into some of the other ways a line can change. And instead of the line saying F, it could say S. And S, as in this one, this is a WF6S. S means line sinks. Okay, for F for float, S for sink. That's, that part's pretty easy to understand. But after the S, there is a number three. And if I take up another fly line and compare them side by side, you'll see that this one says WF6S3, and this one says WF5S6. Okay, so they're both weight forwards. Hopefully you got that. This is for a six weight rod. This is for a five weight rod. They both sink, but that last number tells you the difference between the two sinking lines. This one sinks at three inches every second. And this one sinks at six inches. That's what that last number does. Sink, six. Six inches every second. So you kind of do this kind of thing. Right? This is a much faster sinking line. Gets down to the deeper parts of the lake way quicker than this one. And so, as a, as a regular trout angler, you're unlikely to go into sinking lines, but if you start getting into sinking lines, that's what those numbers mean. At the very end, that's how fast it sinks in inches per second. And the last little letter that it can end in, it could end in a letter I, like this. This is a weight forward 6I. The I stands for intermediate. And really what that means, it's a line that kind of sinks very slowly. It's not quite a floater, and it's definitely not as fast as sinking as a sinker. So this is a very, very slow sinking line. And in fly line terminology, that means it's an intermediate. So its designation at the end is always going to be I for intermediate. And as if that wasn't enough, the boffins who came up with sinking lines and floating lines and numerals and letters and codes have also mixed them up. They've mixed them up to say something like this. This says WF8FS3. Hopefully you could work that out if I said pop quiz. What does that mean? Well, could you work that out? Well, yes, kind of. Weight forward, good. Eight weight, got an eight weight rod, that's good. Floating and sinking. Well, a line can't do both. So what that means is most of the line floats, but the front section, the front tip of that line sinks. So this is what's called a sink tip line. It's a floating line where the front end sinks, and in this case, the front end sinks at three inches per second. So fly lines have these codes. You can also get, and this, you should certainly work this one out now after I've just explained all that to you. What do you think that means? This one has WF6FI. Answers on the postcard to me. Ha, just joking. It is, WF means weight forward, six for a six weight rod, F floating line with an intermediate slow sinking tip. So that's the code. As I said, pretty complicated, but logical, I think, once you understand it. And that means when you go into a fly shop and you've got your five weight rod and you're looking for a particular fly line, you can start to choose that line by working out what that code is and choosing the right line for what you want to do. 
once you've chosen the right line, you're going to stick it onto your fly reel. But as we talked about in reels, between the reel and the fly line, you put on something called backing. Here's backing. And you'll note that this thing says two things, 20 pound, 100 yards. Now, what backing is, essentially backing is an extension to your fly line. Your fly line, most fly lines are about 90 feet long. Let's say you make a lovely cast, it goes out 60 feet and you hook the fish of your lifetime. And that fish is strong and big and it swims away. Well, if you've got 60 feet out and your line's only 90 feet, you can run out of line real fast and lose the fish because you ran out of line. So almost invariably, before you put your fly line on, you want to put this stuff called backing on. It's way cheaper than fly line. It's way thinner than fly line. And so underneath the reel, in this case, on this reel here, underneath my fly line, I'm going to have about 100 yards of 20 pound backing because that's a great go-to backing for the trout angler. I'm going to wind that on. And then once I wound my backing on, I'm going to attach my fly line to that backing. And on that note, here is a fly line. When you open up these beautiful boxes and pull out the fly line, it's usually going to be on some kind of plastic spool. And why that's important? Well, that part's not important, but what is important is if I pull off the end that's on top, you'll see that there's a label. There's a label at the back end of this fly line. And this line, this label actually says, attach this end to backing. This is how you know it's the back end of your line. Now, cast your mind back you know, a couple of minutes ago when I was showing you the difference between a double taper line and a weight forward line, right? A weight forward line has weight at the front end. So the worst thing you can do with a weight forward line is put the weight at the back, attach the weight to the reel, and have the thin stuff at the front. You're trying to cast this thin stuff, and it's going to go nowhere because it's thin and light. So you've got to get a weight forward on the right way around. And so almost all line manufacturers have a little label saying, attach this end to your backing. That means this is the thin part. And then as you wind your line on, you're going to find that. I'm going to wind all this yellow stuff on. And then I'm going to wind on that. And I'm going to come to the green section. And that becomes the fat stuff, the weight forward line. And at the end of that fat weight forward line, there's also an end. Also with the loop. So they've got loops on each end. But with this label, this label is telling me which end to attach the reel. And I think the last thing to talk about on this really is just a word of warning to avoid frustration and, and throwing away a brand new fly line. And that word of warning is how you should wind the line onto the reel. They come on plastic spools for a reason, not so you can take them off and throw them away and try and attach your fly line and wind it on this way. You do want to keep the fly line on the spool and you want to put a little pen through the center hole here kind of create a rotating drum. And when you wind on, you want to make sure the drum rotates in this direction. So I'm winding like that, pulling line off. And I say that because the other thing you could do, which I see a lot, is you can try and wind the line off this way, side on, like a clock face coming off around. And that will put in endless twist and spin into your fly line. Don't ever do that. You'll get so annoyed with the frustrated twists and spins on the line. So once you attach your backing to your fly line, stick a pen through, get your buddy to hold the end of this or stick it between your knees and wind in, making sure the line spins in this vertical plane rather than off the face of the clock. You see there's a couple of twisties here, right, that are holding the line in place. So you'd obviously undo those twisties first. I just don't want to undo this and get line all over the place. But that's it. That's how you attach your line to your backing onto the reel. And as I showed you just now, on the front end of that line, there's that green loop. And that green loop is for attaching your leader to. And that's the very next thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the various different types of leader you can and should use in fly fishing. <music>so you've got your fly line and your backing set up on the reel your fly line ends in this little loop as i mentioned and now on the end of this loop you attach the next section that section is called the leader the leader has a couple of uses first of all this fly line is pretty visible so if i tied a fly to it the fish is going to see it and get scared secondly and perhaps more importantly is that without a leader this fly line has so much weight at the front it turns over with a big bang lands on the water with a splash scares the fish 
whereas a leader slows down that and gives you what's called turnover and presentation. So the leader's an integral part to getting nice gentle casts to avoid scaring the very fish you want to catch. So let's look at a leader. Here's a leader coil that I've taken out of one of the bags. It's got a big supply of leaders here, and I'm just going to undo this leader, unravel it, because I want to show you a couple of things about the leader, a little bit of terminology about the leader and a little bit of significance about that terminology. When you take a leader off, you will find that one end is very fat and one end is very thin. So let's have a look at this back end here. There's a loop on this end tied in, quite a fat, stiff piece of material right here. And this loop is what attaches to the loop on the front end of your line. So a little loop to loop connection, you connect the two together. So the fat part of the leader connects to the part of the line here with a loop to loop connection. And as you work your way down the leader, you'll notice that I've got this section here called the butt section, and it's quite level and quite fat for, I don't know, three or four feet. And now I can just feel it getting thinner in my left hand. So I've got a level section here called the butt. Now it's getting thinner and tapering and getting thinner getting thinner, still tapering. So this is the section that's called the taper because it tapers down and now it's about the same diameter. This front level section right here is the tippet. So there's three components to a leader. There's the level front end, the tippet. There's the taper in that middle section. And then there's a level section at the back called the butt. So that's what your leader components are. And one thing you'll notice when you take the leader off and unwrap it like this, you'll see that there's quite a bit of coil and memory to it. And that's a bad performing leader. So when you've done your leader and you unwrapped it before you put it on the line and certainly before you fish it, just give it a good stretch, pull out the memory. See how that is? And then I've got a nice nasty coily section here. So I'm just going to stretch that memory out. And I'm going to get a much better presentation of my leader having gotten rid of those coils. So that's kind of a little tip on the side, that one for you. Stretch the leader once you've taken it out the bag. And that's what you've got. I'm going to come back to the leader and the tapers in a moment. But first, let's tell, talk about how leaders differ. And there's really only two ways a leader could differ. Sure, they can be in different materials and da-dee-da, but let's just worry about the two critical things. One is the size of it, the diameter, and the other is the length. Let's start with the length. Right here, I've got about the shortest leader I use. It's six foot long. And if I put that one down and pull out the longest leader I use, this is this one. This one's 15 foot long. Right? So leaders vary in length. They're all going to have that level butt section and that taper in the middle and that level tip section, but they're just different lengths. And one of the things to talk about length is that the further away your fly is from your fly line, the visibility of the fly line and the impact of your fly line, the better the presentation is, the further away the fly is from the spooky fly line. So the more difficult a fish you try to catch, generally speaking, the longer the leader becomes. More on that in a second. The other thing the leader can differ in is what's called the X, the size. This leader is a 5X. You can see how it says it right there. And next to the 5X, this size it says length, but next to the size X, it tells us that this leader is 4.7 pound. That means the strength of the thinnest part of the line is 4.7 pounds, but it's also, this one's called 5X. Now, leaders vary. This one is 4X. It's a different X, 6.4 pounds, a little bit stronger. It's a little bit thicker. So the 4X is thicker than the 5X. The 3X is thicker than the 4X, and it's a bit stronger, 8.2. And if I go up another one, here's a 2X. That's a bit thicker still. That's 10 pound. So it's thicker and stronger. So that's the other way your leaders differ, is they have this X system that tells you whether it's a thick or thin. A big number like a 7X or an 8X is a very, very thin leader. And a little number like 1X and 2X is a very, very thick leader. And really, that's about the strength, right? This one, let's put these two side by side. 2X and 5X. This one's 10 pounds. And this one's 4.7 pounds, right? So there's different strengths of the two. These aren't the same length, but they could be the same length. Why would you choose one over the other? Well, one answer is simply the fish. If you're trying to catch a big fish, you want a strong leader because it's stronger and it's likely to break off a thin leader. 
if you're trying to present a tiny little fly with no drag and no visibility of your leader, you probably want a very, very thin leader because that tiny fly needs a thin leader to attach to it to get natural movement in the water. So one answer to the length and to the size of the leader is the fact that you are fishing for bigger fish or smaller fish. The other answer is a little bit more complicated, but essential to know, even if you're a complete novice at fly fishing. Because one day you're going to get down to the river, and one day a guide is going to tell you, you know what, Simon, we need to fish a big streamer today. So he pulls out of his box a, just a gigantic weighted thing like this, like a bent sausage. And you can see the front of it's pulled down. That shows you how much weight's in there. It's got heavy, very heavy eyes. It's long. It's an absolute pig to cast for most people because it's so heavy and casting on a little light fly rod and fly line is really, really tricky. Well, a rule of thumb with heavy flies is the bigger the fly, the closer to the fly line you should have it. This fly line's got lots of weight. So if I was to tie the fly to this fly line and cast it, the fly line will turn it over and that makes it really easy. And so if I put a thin bit in between, the longer that thin bit becomes, the harder it is for this bit of fly line to turn over this fly and cast it. That's what makes casting big flies really tricky. So the first step you should do if you're casting flies that get bigger and bigger is shorten your leader length. Nice easy tip makes a world of difference when you're trying to cast these big flies. But the other thing is the size of the stuff you tie it to. This is that really thin leader I started off with. If I tied this big fly to this really super thin tippet, again, this has got nothing. There's no way this thin tippet can cast this big fly. It just physically can't do it. It's way too supple. If I was to tie that to the back end of this leader that is stiff and wiry, well, a much better transition. So the other rule of thumb, not only should your heavy fly be closer to the fly line, the heavy fly should be on a thicker leader material. So you can just keep that in mind. The bigger your fly is, the shorter that leader should be, and the thicker, the lower X number, or the bigger, the stronger the material should be to cast that fly. And when you're fishing tiny little flies, like this little soft tackle here, that's going to land very gently on the water in its own right because it's small, that needs as much natural movement in the water as possible, that wants to be as far away from the impact of my fly line landing, that's when I'm going to go a longer leader and a thinner leader. So in a nutshell, your leader choice is based on fish size to some extent, but really it's actually based on the size of your fly and what you're trying to do with it. Now, let's go back to the leader. And let's look at these three sections again. My level butt section ends about here. You can feel it. And then my middle taper section that gets thinner and thinner and thinner to about, about there. And then I've got my level tip section, which is, in this case, looks to be about three feet long. So let's tie a fly on. Snip it off. Let's tie another fly on. Snip it off. Tie another fly on. Snip it off. What you're going to find is that as you tie on flies, this level section is going to get shorter and shorter and get towards a thicker material. So when you fish leaders, tapered leaders like this in particular, you want to pay attention to this level section. And let's say I've got three feet of 5x material on here. And I start to chop off my three feet of 5x and I want that same performance of the leader. All I need to do instead of getting a brand new leader is I would get a spool of tippet material. This is what this stuff's called. This is called tippet material. Admittedly, this is only 4x, but I would attach on here three feet of 5x material, and that will bring my leader back to exactly the same leader as it came out of the bag. So leaders are fairly simple, right? There's the length difference, and then there's the x difference, and that's um, kind of your rules of thumb on that one. And then as they get shorter and shorter, you do want to add your tippet. The best way of thinking what tippet really is, is to go back to the leader. Remember the leader had level butt section, and then a nice taper, and then a level tip section. Well, imagine if that level tip section was just extended, and there was lots of it, and that's what tip it, tip it is. It's a level tip section extended. So whereas this leader had three feet of 4x on the front end, this spool has 50 yards of 4x. 
And so it's a great way of saving a pile of money and not buying lots of leaders and having to replace your leader every time your 4X disappears and you buy a new leader. You can certainly do that, fly shops love it, but you can also buy a spool of 4X material and as that 4X shrinks, you just add a couple of feet of that back to the normal length that you're fishing and that's beautiful, right? That's gonna last you a long time. So that's the simplest use of tippet is just to keep the leader as it was and to make it unrolled and, and fish how, you, how it fished before you shorten the tippet. But another use of tippet is that you could have a bunch of leaders that are, let's say, 2x. And you're fishing a 2x leader because you think that's the right leader. Uh, you've got a big fly on or there's a strong wind or whatever. And then as you start fishing this leader, you start to find that that's too thick for the fly you're fishing, or maybe the fish are not taking a fly and you think, hmm, 2X is pretty strong. I think I'm going to go to a thinner leader. Well, option one, take this leader off, put on a thinner leader. Option two is go to your tippet material and attach to this 2X material something a little bit thinner. So now I could take my 4X and add it to my 2x and now I've created a thinner front end to the leader. So it's not just the lengthening of the lead you've got, it's actually for changing the diameter of your leader. And on that note, what's really important about joining sections of tippet material together is go, always go down in size, always go thinner. You're trying to build up a taper. You're trying to make a cast that unrolls and lands nicely on the water. And that's very easy to do if you have a kind of a taper or a funnel shape. So that taper and the funnel shape unrolls the energy to the front end. And as long as you have a fat section going to a middle section, going to a medium fine section, to a fine section, to an ultra fine section, you create this lovely long taper and you'll get these great casts and these great turnovers. And what you don't want to do is start the taper and get to a thin point and then go to a fat bit because that fat bit the fatter material is going to be much harder to turn over going that way. So that means when you have a selection of tippet materials as I have here in my fishing pocket, I have got 4X and then I've got a little bit thicker material, that's 3X, and a little bit thicker material still, 2X, and of course an even thicker material, 1X. And so by having a selection of tippet sizes in your pocket, you can adjust your leaders, you can change the diameter of your leaders, you can increase the taper length of your leaders of whatever leader you're fishing. Highly recommended that you get a bunch of these materials, keep them in your pocket when you're fishing or in your fishing bag or in your vest or whatever it is you have, and then you're pretty well set up for everything in the fly fishing world, all the kit that you need. That's a lot of gear, a lot of information about gear, a lot of gear to have, it's probably confused and complicated things, but I want you just to bear in mind that there's a reason for every little thing, and the purpose of this episode is really just to give you some background information about rods and reels and lines and leaders and tippet to help you choose the right tackle for your next day out on the water. And talking of the day on the water, you know what I think? I think it's time to leave this studio and get down to the river and just show you how to put together your rod, reel and line and get out fishing. Once you've got to the water and you've got your car with your gear, you've got to put it together. Generally speaking, it's easier to do it at the car. Everything's here and you can put stuff away. Uh, and as easy as it might sound, I'm just going to run through it because there's a few little steps that make it easier to rig than perhaps you would think. Your rod's in your rod tube. So obviously you take your rod out of your tube. Tube's important, protects it in the car, stops things falling on it and breaking it. Rods aren't cheap. Take it out of the tube, put your tube away. Then the rod's in this, this bag or sock, and again, you can keep it in that. So when you finish fishing at the end of the day, it's always good to put it back in the bag and back in the tube just to protect your rod. And you take it out of this bag, and this is a four-piece rod. What I like to do with, with this is hold the, the bag in my left hand and just with my right hand push the, push the bottom of that. And that, what that does is it exposes the four sections here. I'll take the four sections out in one go, put my bag down. And you'll note in the four sections, there's a fat bit with a handle, there's a medium fat bit, there's a medium skinny bit, and there's a skinny bit. And they all go together to create a nicely balanced outfit. So generally speaking, it makes a lot of sense to attach the skinny bit to the medium skinny bit first. And all you do is you put the two sections together, slide it on just kind of loosely, make sure they're aligned up and you look down them. And you wanna make sure the rings are all aligned. That's a very important step. 
Once they're aligned, you give it a little bit of a poke, a little shove to jam it on, not too tight, because you'll never get it off, and certainly not loose, because when you're casting, what can happen is the top section can fly off. And I do the same section here, put it on, generally align it, look down it, align, give it a tug, that's aligned. And this last section is very interesting because the bottom section doesn't have a rod ring on it. I just, at this stage, I'm just gonna put it on. And you'll see why, we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, I'm gonna put my reel on. My fly reel is in my case for protection, take it out. As we said earlier in the studio, you can have reels that are right hand wind or left hand wind. I, always, I like right hand wind, just that's what I do. And so what you've got to do is make sure you put the reel on the right way on your rod. There's this reel seat here we talked about. Well, under the cork handle, you've got the recess where there's a little area to put the reel on and the seat of the reel goes under that recess. And then I like to slide my non-dominant hand down and pinch the reel seat so it doesn't fall off. And there's this little reel seat here, collar, that slides over the bottom of the reel, and this little nut just tightens up until it's finger tight, and that's your reel on. And you'll note that when I turn the reel downwards, the correct way in fly fishing, the reel's on my right-hand side, so I can wind very effectively. If you set the reel up left-handed, or the shop has set the reel up left-handed, you want to make sure when it's set up and it's down, the handle is on the left side. Right, that's quite important. So when you come to wind it in, you can wind it in the right way. And then the last little part is I have not fully aligned. So as you can see, when I put this reel up, the rod rings aren't fully aligned here. So this is where I will now make the final alignment. Give it a last little poke, pull it on there like that. And now I know that everything is aligned and set up. So now we're gonna thread the rod up, but the last little point of this thing is that your line is gonna come out of the reel in a couple of places. It can come out of the reel in this section, and as you can see, it's facing the wrong direction, coming off the top of the reel. But I like, and I wanna make sure that you know how to, you thread the line through here so that the line comes off the bottom of the reel. You always want the line coming off the bottom of the reel facing up. So that's correctly coming off the reel. And then, before you thread it up, you want to strip off about two rod lengths of line. This is a nine foot rod, so I'm going to strip off 15, 18 feet of line, and you'll see why in a moment. Now, when you come to thread the rod, right, I'm going to stand up to thread the rod. Again, simply you might think, oh, it's really easy to thread up the rod. Well, it is, but I want to show you a couple of little tips that are invaluable. This is a beautiful fly rail, expensive, beautiful fly rail, and I'm going to lay it down in the mud. You might not want to do that, but you're going to do it, and I'll show you why. The front end of the fly line, there's this loop, and this loop goes up into the first guide, the, the stripping guide, as it's called, or the butt guide. It goes up to the second loop, and then I'm going to put the rod down in the mud, in the ground. And here, what's really important is you want to make sure the handle of the reel is facing up. And it's pretty simple why, I'll show you why. Because if the handle of the reel is facing down and you need to pull some line off, look at the handle here, it just churns in the mud and gets dirt and filth into that beautiful, nice reel you've got. You don't want that. So always make sure when you lay it down, the handle of the reel is up, and that way your reel isn't gonna get full of mud and clarty stuff like that. Then you're gonna thread the rod. And to me, the easiest way of threading the rod is simply I'm just gonna lower the rod and walk towards the top end just sliding the loop up as I walk. This is the simplest, safest way, where you're not gonna snap your beautiful brand new fly rod. And then when you get to the end of it, you wanna pull out about, I don't know, six, eight, 10 feet of line to hang down. That's a much better way of rigging the rod than holding on to the rod here and trying to thread and then trying to thread and trying to thread and you're holding the rod and you're starting to bend the rod and oh my gosh, look at this, I can't quite reach the top. So it's just a little bit easier to put the reel down and walk away from the reel, threading it up. And once you've got the basics set up, your rod on reel and line all done, now we're gonna put on a leader. And the leaders, well, they're pretty easy to, to do. I'm gonna take a leader out of the packet, but there's a, cup, there's a really neat trick to, to, a lot of people when they put the leader on, tangle the leader up. And I wanna show you how to avoid that. So you've taken the leader out of the bag, with your non-dominant hand, the easiest thing is to put your thumb and middle finger into that loop of the leader and then open the thumb and index finger and create some tension in that leader. Then you want to go to the fat end where there's a nice little loop. 
And this loop is wrapped around itself about four times. So I'm going to go one and two. I'm going to unwrap it about four times from these coils and three and about four. Okay, and once I've undone it those four times, I'm simply just going to unwind the leader, keeping tension between these two fingers. I don't want to let it go slack because it tangles or it can tangle. So just keep a bit of tension between the thumb and your middle finger. Unwind the leader until it's completely off. And then you'll see the leader is quite coily. It's a stiff material. So before you fish it, before you tie it to the rod, just stretch it out, get rid of the memory as that's what it's called. Get rid of all these coils. You get a higher performance, a better fishing connection to your fly, better casting performance if you stretch the memory out. Then you're going to loop it onto your fly line. And again, we talked about the loop on the fly line and there's a loop on the back end of the leader. And in our next episode of this series uh, is all about knots. So all I'm going to show you now and all the future knots we're going to cover in the next episode. I'm not going to go into the knots now, but basically speaking, you're going to take your fly line and you put your leader on. And once you've looped your leader on, you pull your leader through, you are now rigged and dangerous to the fish. You might say, hey, where's the fly? Well, one thing I like to do is I don't know what to put on. Right now, I have no clue what to put on. I haven't been to the water yet. I haven't seen if there's flies about. I haven't seen if the fish are eating. I have no clue what's going on. So generally, I don't like to put my fly on until I get to the water. So that's what I'll do. That's my rigging technique. I grab my fishing vest. and go and see what's happening on the water. And that's about it. So in this episode, we covered the basic gear you need for fly fishing, some of the differences, some of the way the gear differs and the kind of points you need to look at when you're buying that gear. And of course, how to put it all together and get out on the water. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, look out for episode three, which is our basic knot tying episode and learn all those key fly fishing knots. Get out on the water and enjoy your day on the water. And talking about your day on the water, please remember, respect the environment, leave no trace behind you of your visit. And above all, look after those beautiful fish that you're catching. Thanks for watching.